What an honor to be here. Let's talk to Jesus a minute. Amen. Amen. We're going to talk to him for a long time, and you've been talking to him, but there's nothing that I love more than talking to him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you've overwhelmed us with your presence. Thank you, Lord, that you're rending flesh these days. Thank you, Lord, that you're rending veils and you're lifting veils off of eyes. As your word says in 2 Corinthians 3, Lord, you lift the veil so we can see you face to face. And when we see you and look at your glory, we are changed into your image from glory to glory. And all we want is to be like you. There's nothing we desire more, Lord. As your bride, than to be your helpmate, to know the secrets of your heart, to share them with you, to know the whispers, to know the look of your eye, to know the direction that you give us with your eyes upon us. To know the affection and the love that draws us, as you said in Jeremiah, with cords that can't be broken. Every veil of the past or preconceived ideas or anything that might obscure your face, we ask you to lift it. And wherever we've gone in the places of prayer, in the closets of prayer, in the seasons of prayer, would you take us deeper? Would you take us deeper, Lord? There's so much more we've never tasted, never seen, and never experienced. And more than anything in our lives, Lord, we want all of you. Not just some, we want all. Thank you that you paid for us to have that. Thank you that you tore the veil of your own flesh so that we could commune with you between the wings of the cherubim, face to face as Moses does. If he could do that, Lord, before the veil was even torn in the old covenant, what can we do in the new covenant when you've made a way by your blood for total access, freedom, any time to come boldly before your throne of grace, to share your heartbeat, to hear your secrets, and to carry what's upon your heart. We ask as Moses asked, teach us your ways that we might know you. Teach us your ways that we might know you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you teach us everything we need to know. And the anointing that bides within us teaches us all things. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are the one that occupies these dwelling places to conform us, transform us into the image of Jesus, to pray through us and to teach us to pray. Thank you that you know the mind of Christ. You know the mind of the Father and you reveal it to us because we need to know that, to know how to pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence here. Thank you for your Shekinah glory. Thank you for what you're doing through your bride when deep darkness covers the earth that you're calling us to arise and shine because your glory rests upon us. How we love you, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. What a joy to be here. And you guys have gotten a head start, but I was in San Diego doing this also for three days, and so just came from there. So maybe been in a little bit of a different stream, but I think right in stride, because we're all pursuing the same thing. Amen? Amen. David, I don't... 
Pastor David, I don't know if you ever told your brother how we met, but we just, I walked into a prayer meeting and was going to just enjoy soaking. And i never seen you before in my life. And he says, we have a special speaker tonight. <laughs> i never been there, never shaking your, shook your hand or anything. So here we are. So then, and then a few, <laughs> a year later and, and we're here. So isn't it wonderful how the Lord joins the heart's of his people because they're like-minded. And you know what? You can meet somebody anywhere, anytime, and you can go, oh, that's my tribe. They're in my tribe. They get it. I know I'm in the spirit, not in the natural. And so we just click and we connect. And so there's nothing I love more than prayer meetings. And our prayer meetings over there are sometimes eight hours and sometimes 12 hours. So if they're any shorter than that, it's kind of a short prayer meeting. And so, so we love to pray. And you know why? Because prayer is the business of heaven. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what's Jesus doing in heaven? He ever lives to make intercession for us. And if he's in heaven with the business of heaven before the throne of the Father, 24-7 for you and I, for the lost, for the nations, Peter, I've prayed for you, he said in Luke. Jesus said, how many of you want him praying for you? Whoa, I do. So if that's the business of the bridegroom, what should be the business of the bride? Because he was joined to the Lord as one flesh with him. 1 Corinthians 7, 6, 17. When we are joined to him, we're one flesh. And when you become married to someone, you become one flesh. We were taken from his side, birthed upon the cross, bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh, called to carry what he carries and to love what he loves. And that's the meaning of being the bride of Christ. In Africa, one of the most important pur purposes of having a bride is not just because you fall in love with somebody, but it's to what they call reproduce, right? And that's what God said in Genesis to Adam and Eve, go reproduce after your kind. He, be fruitful. Be multiply. Now, we're going to get into some things here, but I wanted to ask us and ask individually yourself, how fruitful have we been? Have we been reproducing after our kind? Prayer warriors will reproduce prayer warriors. Weepers at the altar will travail for souls, and the souls they, they reproduce will come in weeping. We reproduce after our kind. And so the Lord's interested in a bride bearing his seed. And I want to finish that thought, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit of my testimony. But as we worship, as we were worshiping a little bit ago, the Holy Spirit overshadows us. And what happened when he overshadowed Mary? She conceived. Thank you, Pastor Jerry, Pastor Kimberly, for letting me come and share. She conceived. She conceived in her nothing of the flesh. It was born of the Spirit. What is born of the spirit is spirit. She conceived in her the DNA of God. The living word. Now, when you conceive something, women, you get, you get pregnant. I mean, you get enlarged with it, right? So my challenge to our men, because we have over 800 Arabic-speaking missionaries in eight nations now. We're in a going into 10, and it started with one prayer meeting. Five to 6,000 people a month are coming to Jesus. Now, I, t I, amen, and I tell the men, praise Jesus, praise Jesus. I tell the men, I tell the missionaries, we're sending out into war zones and dangerous and into ISIS and in the 1040 window where I work, get pregnant and don't go unless you're pregnant. The ladies can understand that. But when you conceive something and it grows in you, 
you can't just drop it when you want to and say, well, I'm going on vacation now. I'll pick it up when I get back. How many ladies have done that? Well, it's getting kind of heavy now. This burden's getting kind of heavy. I'm tired of carrying it. I'll just put it over here for a while and then pick it up when I want to. It is within you. It is attached to you. It is the bloodline of the Father. And he has chosen to deposit something in his bride that he doesn't want aborted. He wants it birthed. And before that birthing process comes, the burden will enlarge you. It'll stretch you. You get uncomfortable. Comfort is an enemy of change. You get uncomfortable, can't sleep at night, your appetite changes, you're restless, and you get the room ready. Many of us are praying for revival, and I'm going, Lord, do we have the room ready for a 1,000 people to walk in the door? Revival hit over there, and I thought, where are we going to sleep them all? How am I going to feed them all? I said, God... These guys are murderers. They're right out of the prisons. They're criminals. They're killing, wanted by the police. Prostitutes, trafficking, 100 saved, just like that, in a few days. I said, we got to get them off the streets. He said, well, I thought you had the room ready. You were asking me for this. (laughs) And so we had the property. We didn't have the room ready. If we're serious and mean business with God, about revival. Get the rooms ready. Get the workers ready. Who's going to clean the fish? Who's going to take the scales off? Who's going to do the deliverance? Who's going to do the inner healing? Who's going to do the disciple? Get the assembly line ready. And so Mary grows with that vision. She's conceived. She's enlarged. A vision will enlarge you. It'll enlarge your thinking. It'll enlarge your your mind. I mean, a a conception. 1 Kings 4.29, Solomon was given largeness of heart and then wisdom to know what to do with it. God must enlarge us with a burden for prayer and a burden for souls. Get pregnant. Now we get pregnant with nations. Who had two nations in her womb? Rebecca. That's what the word says in Genesis. Jacob and Esau, two nations were in her womb. You cannot give birth to something in prayer that you have not carried in pregnancy, that you have not carried in your womb. These days that we're going to get be together, and I, and I want to put some deposits about Prayer, I want to put salt on your tongue. That's what I want to do. I just want to pour salt on your tongue to make you so thirsty. We can't keep quiet, like Isaiah 62 says. And then tomorrow, we're going to get more into the battling of prayer, and then tomorrow evening into the birthing of prayer. There's a battling, there's a birthing. There's a weeping, there's a warring. There's a washing his feet. And there's a wondering and meditation. God will teach you his ways in the closets of prayer. Because Moses said, teach me your ways, Lord. They're in your sanctuary, Psalm 103. When Moses cried out, teach me your ways that I might know you. As busy as a man as he was, hours of intercession in the tent of meeting. Hours. Commune with me face to face. i got things to tell you. And the Lord poured out his heart to this man. Talked to him intimately as a friend. And I asked the Lord this once, weeping. I said, God, how can we pray for 10 years for a nation to be delivered? How can we pray for 10 and 20 years sometimes? And Moses prayed one sentence and you delivered a nation. One sentence in Genesis 32 when God was so angry about the golden calf. And he said, I'm just going to wipe them out. I'm going to blot them out, and I'll start over with you, Moses. 
I'm so angry at the sin in America now. I'll just blot it out. And I'll start over with a few. And Moses, who knew God like that yes. in the tent of meeting, dared before his father, his friend, to say, you can blot me out, Lord. You can take my life, and you can remove me, but would you remember your covenant? And in one sentence, God changed his mind for a nation. I said, God, could we have that kind of favor? Esther had when she went in before the king, fasting. If I die, I die. But what's more important, my life or a nation? And we got to ask ourselves that right now. When we're sending 240 missionaries into the 1040 window, and I said, how many of you are ready to go? Do or die. It's a prayer movement, but it may be a movement of martyrs. How many want to go? Libya, Morocco, up there. Bring the underground church above ground. Darfur, up there. Chad, that's where we are. Every hand, shoot up. Middle East, take Jesus openly, boldly. Build his church. Every hand, shoot up. Why, and this is what they say. Why wouldn't we give what is temporal to gain what is eternal? Let's ask ourselves that about prayer. Would we give what is temporal? Food, sleeping, entertainment. The reason I say that is it's going to cost us something if we want to go to another level. It's going to cost us something. You know that song, Lord, you are more precious than silver. You're more cost. I used to say, Lord, you are more precious than sleeping. Lord, you are more costly than food. Because I don't have diamonds and rubies. So I can't compare them to something I don't have. And the, you know, it's like, well, you're more precious than a million dollars. Well, I don't have a million dollars, so I can't compare but I can say you're more precious than eating and sleeping. The things I have, I can lay aside that are temporal, as 2 Corinthians 4, 4 18 says, to, to gain what is eternal, to pull heaven on earth, the business of prayer. That's what kingdom business is. Because prayer births a harvest after his kind. Prayer positions us to love what God is about to do. If we've not been in prayer, we might be guilty of being like the other son that didn't run away and was called the prodigal in Luke 15. He ran away, right? He said, let, let, me, let me have my dad's blessings and gifts, but I don't want his presence. I, I can go out on my own now, but just give me your stuff, dad. Have we ever done that? So he leaves until he comes to the end of himself. Comes to his senses, Luke 15 says. I believe the father is watching and weeping and waiting, yearning for that son. If we could feel the intercession of Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, weeping over every lost, carrying that with him. And I believe that yearning and that prayer. Because when the son came, started coming home, he saw him. He ran towards him and threw his arms around him, weeping and embracing. But the other son wasn't prepared to receive the harvest. God, keep us from being the second prodigal. Prayer keeps us in a position to say, God, I don't know. I don't care who you bring into my house. I don't care how many heroin addicts. And I've had those girls come in, sleeping in their cars. Oklahoma, for 25 years, I'd bring them off the streets like lost puppies, shooting up. They're going through deliverance, vomiting all over my rug, detoxing. And then Jesus says, where are you going to let them sleep? I said, well, there's a sofa there. He said, is that where you'd put me? I said, oh, well, I'd give you my bed. Well, then give me your bed. Because when you do it to the least of these, you're doing it unto me. So I slept on the floor and give him my bed. Are we prepared for a thousand like that to come in? Are we prepared for sleepless nights? 
Are we prepared to give them the beds and give them the meals? If we haven't learned to sacrifice in the places of prayer, we'll never learn to sacrifice when it comes time to feeding those babies. You know why mamas get up in the middle of the night, change the diapers? They're so tired they could fall over on the floor and they have to feed them and nurse them and burp them and change the diapers because they carried them for nine months. You will die for what you've given birth to. But if I give birth to it and ask you to love it, uh uh-uh, wasn't yours. But when you carry something in prayer, and it's a burden of God, and you birth it in prayer, you will die for that harvest. You will die for that nation. You will lay your life down, and it will not even be a sacrifice. That's why God wants us in the position to be prepared for the harvest and the answers. Amen. Amen. So, my grandmother was a prayer warrior in China. She passed the baton to me. I was eight years old. She'd come on, honey, let's sit down. And I saw her a couple times in my life, and she'd just rock away. It's time for prayer. She said, come on in. She'd pray one hour, two hours. She'd go on and on, send the hound of heaven after him, God. She'd weep for another soul, 15 minutes. Weep for another soul, 15 minutes. Weep for another. And I'm just watching her like this is a scene out of heaven. And she travails and she cries for him and she weeps with passion. In Africa, one thing I found, they pray with their body, soul, and spirit. It's not half-hearted. When we're praying, it's all in. And so she, then she finished, she said, okay, it's your turn, honey. Well, I'm eight years old. <laughs> but you know what? That's when I learned to pray. And I learned to love it. And when I was in the Philippines growing up in the middle of ISIS and terrorism, I watched my dad live on his knees. I watched my dad pray all night. I watched God conceal him For 45 years, they looked for his head on a platter. And he never left, never evacuated, never kidnapped, never hurt, as others were doing. He lived in prayer, and God protected him in the place of prayer. He hid him from the enemy, and he blinded the enemies. In prayer, how many of us know the voice of God this well? He'd say, God, I'm going out to this terrorist village. Do you want me to take the bus or do you want me to take the motorcycle? Deep, deep in some remote place. And the Lord would say, turn to Ezekiel something. The wheel in the middle of the wheel. There's two wheels. Okay, I'm going to take the motorcycle. And the bus is bombed. That day. Next day. He's out there witnessing, laying hands on the sick, miracles happening, preaching the gospel. Next day, should I take the bus? Should I take the motorcycle? And the Lord shows him four wheels. Okay, take the bus. All the motorcycles are decapitated, ambushed, killed, slaughtered. I live in a place where the missionaries going into villages with no cell phones, no maps, and they're being hid in body bags, smuggled across the border. They've interceded. They've travailed for these souls. And when they get on the ground, they're ready to meet the Lord anyway. But they've, they've carried in the place of prayer and wept for something they're ready to die for. And that's the harvest. That's the lost. Otherwise, why are we praying? We can just have a sweet love relationship with Jesus. Let's go to heaven and enjoy it even more. But we're here for something, huh? We're here to reproduce. We're here to reproduce. So they get out of the body bag, and they go, okay, here we are. Which village? Where do I go? And the Lord will say, right, left, right, left, until they get to the exact little hut. Now, if you miss it, you're dead. The reason they can hear like that, they've learned to listen in the prayer closet. Prayer is not just talking. It's two-way. It's communicating. It's two-way. 
And the greatest, most powerful prayers are those that you hear him pray and you come into agreement with him. They'll come to the little hut there and there'll be 40 or 50 Muslim-clad nationals in that hut. They said, we've been waiting for you. What took you so long to get here? And he said, well, I had to fight a few snakes and come through the swamp and be, you know, carried over in a, in a, in a gunny sack and then dropped off here. And, you know, I mean, that's what they go through to go after the baby they're ready to birth because they're pregnant. They're pregnant. And when you're pregnant, when you're about ready to give birth to a baby, you're not thinking about yourself. Right. You're not thinking about, what are we going to have for lunch? Where are we going to go out to eat? What, what am I going to, you know, shop? And buy? You're thinking about nothing about, except get that baby out. <laughs> That's all you think about. Yes, and I'm talking spiritually. That's exactly how these men feel. That's exactly how we live. It has nothing to do with danger. And the embassy said, you didn't just go on those roads, did you? I sure did. He said, those are off limits. They just slaughtered World Health Organization people. UN off limits, US Embassy off limits, and you go into the most volatile tribe of South Sudan? Are you kidding? And the, and the consular looks at me like that in South Sudan, and I said, I'm not kidding, sir. I just went in and I came out, and I'm glad I didn't ask you first. <laughs> but I appreciate the warning. You know why? Because when you're pregnant, we were pregnant with that tribe, the most violent tribe, according to BBC News, in the world. All we could think about is, we got to get this baby out. we got to see these souls. It has nothing to do with us. It has to do with reproducing after our kind after his kind. So I learned prayer from my dad, I learned prayer from my grandmother, and as a child, loved to take my Bible and go out for hours. Nobody taught me that. I remember saying at 12 years old, I want to pray like my dad. I want to pray like Moses. I want to pray like the people in the word. And Jesus said to me one thing, and I say this to you, if you want to go to another level in prayer life, he said this to me, you give me the time, and I will teach you. You will never learn to pray from reading a book. You'll never learn to pray from listening to this sermon or teaching. You're never going to learn to pray from watching any, anything. You're going to learn to pray by praying. That's it. And so the more time you give the Holy Spirit to be your trainer, the more he, he teaches you. He takes you deeper. He teaches your hands to war. Psalm 144. We're going to talk about battle. We're going to talk about how to be totally equipped and to come against strongholds, to identify them, to discern. We're going to talk about birthing. But I just want to put salt. I know you've been talking so much about prayer, but I just want even to dump more salt there. So after I was working in Oklahoma, somebody said, where, do, where did you see the dead race? I'm go going up there in Africa, you know, and, and God's doing all the miracles at the book of Acts and and raising the dead and casting out devils and healing. And he said, well, how, how did you, you're, you, you're not from Africa. How, how do you see, I've been there 20 years, so they don't say that anymore, but even in the early days. I said, well, I learned it in Oklahoma. Do you know we have Satanists here in America? We have witch doctors here in America. We have children abducted right under our noses in America. I could go on and on. I said, Africa's no different. No different. But if you saw how we pray there, and I go, well, why aren't we seeing everything in the book of Acts in America? We want the power of Acts, but do we want the prayer life of Acts? Yeah. Wow. Come on. That's so good. That's they good. met every day, every day for prayer. Teaching <laughs> went out. God added to the church. Prayer begins with intimacy. And I believe the Lord calls us. I was reading Song of Solomon. And I challenge you to read it tonight. Go home and read Song of Solomon. It's eight chapters. You can read it before you go to bed in about 30 minutes. And underline every verse in there about romance and intimacy and the Lord calling us. My heart is ravished after you. 
I want you. I want your, your friendship. I want to look in your eyes. I want to hear your voice. That's how he feels about you. That's how he feels about his bride. Why? He wants her to be a helpmeet. He wants her to be one flesh with him. That's us. And it talks about the Shunammite woman getting up in the middle of the night and, and looking for the one whom her soul loves. And she couldn't find him. She went out into the streets with this frantic looking. That's how much she wanted prayer. And she said, and when I found him, I grabbed him and I wouldn't let him go. Intimacy will lead you to intercession. And intercession will become interception. The plan off the enemy before he attacks. Right now, we got a lot of bloody messes in our nation that need to be cleaned up. From unborn babies all the way to schools and children and youth and relationships and homes falling apart. And it's time as the body of Christ that we get ahead of the devil's plan Amen. instead of trying to clean him up. Amen? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. He said, call unto me, and I'm going to show you things you don't even know if you're willing to stand in a gap. So when I got the call to go to Africa, and I said, Lord, I've been praying. Send me where no one wants to go. You know why I am praying that? I'm not a real adventurer. Well, I kind of am. I love to. But, but I wasn't doing that, saying that because I'm just, you know, out for one of those survivor shows or whatever. You know, I just, wherever there's unborn babies in the spirit that have never heard the name of Jesus. Romans 9, 25 and 26 says, I'm going to call her those naked, warring, killing tribes there. A whole country of precious Muslims that Jesus loves, dressed in burqas. He said, I'm going to call her my bride. She just doesn't know it yet. Who is going to tell her? The addicts in our street. The sex transfer, I don't know the terminologies. I've gone to, but all the stuff that's happening with identity crises. Yeah. The alcoholics. All of that. Jesus said, I love them. Those are my kids. Yes. They just don't know it yet. Who wants to carry them? Who wants to give birth? If we understand the purpose in prayer, then prayer becomes a delight. If we lose sight of the purpose, then we take it like a burden. Well, this is just a, a discipline. God wants to take a discipline, turn it into a delight, and cause us to be desperate for it. Because God answers the prayer of the desperate. I was taking the kids one time when they were little and witnessing in the streets of Oklahoma. We were going into the bars. We went up and down the alleys, lay on the concrete, 4 o'clock in the morning in abortion clinics. We wept. We travailed everything we could do in every direction we were doing with prayer and then put feet to our faith and action. And so we were out witnessing, and this, this guy was in a band, rock band and back in the back alleys, campus corner, and he looked at me. And as we were talking to him about Jesus, and he's kind of half drunk, but he, he's sitting there in, in this bar, and as I'm talking about Jesus so passionately, like, like I've been praying for this guy, I've never seen him in my life, like I've been praying for him for months, I just didn't know who he was. And so it's like I just wanted to, to just grab him like a father and say, do you know he loves you? Do you know he's yearning for you to come home? And as I'm talking, I didn't do that, but as I'm talking to him like that, he starts weeping. And he said, oh, my goodness, my grandma must be praying for me right now. <laughs> and I looked at him and I go, what made you say that? And he said, well, you wouldn't be here if she wasn't praying for me. Now, that was a half-drunk man that reminded me that God only brings the lost in because somebody has prayed. That's true. I was praying for a man named Virgil for 27 years. His wife was a sweet intercessor. 
He was an alcoholic, would come home drunk, pass out on the floor, vomit, praying for 27 years. We wept, we warred, we witnessed him. He'd come to Jesus, go back to the gutter. Come to Jesus, go back, deliver everything. We did everything you could think of. And he stayed in the gutter. And we never quit praying until he's in ICU and ready to die. Riddle diabetic. And when he weeps with repentance on his deathbed and seals that salvation, asking the Lord to forgive him, I was exceedingly joyful on one hand, but I was angry on the other hand. I said, God, talk to me. Did you let me waste 27 years on one man when he wanted, he waited to the last five minutes of his life. That's all that 27 years of travailing for. Have you ever prayed for somebody? For one year, two years, three years, four years? Where's the answer? The Lord taught me a valuable lesson. He said, excuse me? Your labor in vain is, in the Lord is never in vain. Who said you wasted 27 years? He said, I collected every single tear in the bottle. He said, you know how many bottles I have lined up? He said, I needed those bottles for 1,000 alcoholics who had nobody else to pray for them. And I took your intercession, and I used it to soften the hearts of 1,000 other drunks you'll never meet till you go to heaven. I said, oh, forgive me. Forgive me. You may think you're praying for one prodigal child, and you pray for that prodigal child for 10 years, and go, why am I praying for 10 years? Because God needs your intercession to bring in a 1,000 more that have nobody interceding for it. Amen. Amen. His ways are so much higher than our ways. So when I got to Africa, and it's blood and guts, and it's a war zone, and the U.S. Embassy had made it off limits, you're going to come home in a body bag, they even said, you can't cross the Nile. I said, I'm going. I said, I can't find in the book of Acts where they checked the weather, <laughs> checked the safety, checked the news, and checked the budget. And then you go. Absolute opposite. Stoned, left for dead, thrown out of the city. And he wakes up, Paul does, and he says, let's go right back in there. we got a job to finish. Total opposite. What made that man think like that? What gave him that kind of kingdom mindset? They knew how to pray. They picked the culture of heaven as they prayed. Matthew 6, 6 says, you want open rewards? You want blessings in your businesses and families? Blessings in the work of your hands? You want open rewards? Check your secret prayer. That's what he said. Close your door. I'm going to talk about closet and I'm going to talk about corporate. But for closet prayer, he said, you close your door. You go in to the inner chamber in the intimacy and listen and commune. I'm not talking about five minutes. I'm talking about give him hours. Give him a day sometime. Because you can take a day to do your stuff. Take a day to do his stuff. You go in and close the door. And spend a day. And he said, watch for the open rewards that will follow. You can measure secret prayer, open rewards. My habit has been to take a Sabbath for prayer. I don't turn on the television, look, I don't even have one. But to turn it, watch tel- preachers and read books. And it's me and Jesus. Me and the word and my notebook. That's all. Sometimes I take a hymn that hymnal, because I love the hymns. But I take my Bible and my notebook, and I, and I turn the phone off, I lock the door, and I close the blinds. So if the postman or somebody comes in, they're not going to see me doing something radical, like dancing like a crazy man around the living room, which I do, you know, or weeping and bawling and travailing on the floor, you know, or shouting and declaring the word. I mean, I want to do anything with total freedom. So I close the window, and I got the whole house. Eight hours. Eight hours. And I'll talk, I'll talk more about the waves of prayer. Going with the breaker 
until it breaks on the shore and you draw back and worship and you go with another burden until it breaks on the shore. And you do that for hours. And then you listen and you weep and you travail and you hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, through the church, for the church. And at the end of eight hours, I've said, oh my goodness, I've got to go pick the kids from school or whatever. It's time. And I said, where did the time go? I could have gone another eight hours. When we pray like that, yeah. that's why you can see it's so easy to do overnight prayer meetings, 12 hours, and it's just like, where'd the time go? And the Lord said to me, that's what Jacob said. When he worked 14 years for Rachel, he said, they seem like a few days. 14 years? Why? He was in love with her. When you're in, so in love with him, hours of prayer will be a few minutes and it's not enough. You don't want to leave. And so I turned the car into a prayer closet. Communion. I was just worshiping with my eyes open. And so <laughs> worshiping. Sometimes I get on the phone and go, let's pray. And we'll be in two or three hours travailing. And they go, are you driving? I said, I think the Holy Spirit's driving. Cause, but but I just, I've got to get somewhere. And so we'll do that in the car. And there are times I pull over and I just fall over the, the steering wheel in travail and I, on the side of the road. So I'm washing dishes one day and do the same thing. Just I have more salt water in my dishwater, you know, just <laughs> pouring in. But this, the presence of the Lord, when you have it in the closet, then it's, it doesn't change when you go to the streets, when you're, when you're in the kitchen, when you're driving your car. No difference. No difference. Prayer is everywhere. Prayer, prayer encompasses you. But don't think it's going to take the place of the closet. It didn't with Jesus. We need that communion. Isn't it something that the disciples saw his power? They saw the miracles. They saw Lazarus raised from the dead. They saw the devils cast out. They saw all these things, and they, said, they didn't say, Jesus, would you teach us to cast those devils out and raise the dead just like you did? Teach us to pray because they watched his lifestyle. He got up, and he went along with his father, and he knew that's the lifeline to strength, to power, to insight, to discernment, to intimacy. He and his father were one. He never wanted to be separated from his father's burden. And I was washing dishes, just weeping, enjoying the fellowship of the Lord. And he said, dry your hands and go get a pen and write this down. And he's just talking to me. Do you know when you pray in that intimacy, you breathe out a love language. I just just love you, Jesus. I just love you. And then you take time to listen. Stop talking. And then you go a little bit more. Oh, you're beautiful. I can even smell your perfume. I can smell your aftershave, Lord. It smells good. I love you in the room. What do you want to say? I love you. Thank you for doing Then you stop. Listen. When you do that enough times, he's going to realize you really want to hear his heart. You're not in there to just get, you know, cover a laundry list and, you know, your prayer needs and then, and then leave. That's what it means to seek his face. But we spend so much time in the closet looking for his hands. What are you going to do next? When are you going to answer this? Would you just move? Would you? Moses went after the face of God. Israel went after the hands. And there's a big difference. If we want healing in our land, he said, if my people, that's you and I right here, called by his name, and if you're believers, you're Christians. That's the name of Jesus Christ gives us. Followers of Jesus will humble themselves. Prayer is the language of the poor. As soon as we think we can do it on our own, well, I can handle the day. I got this thing. We won't pray. And blessed are the poor in spirit, for this is the kingdom of heaven. It's the language of the poor. It is the language of the humble. He who prays will not sin. He who sins will not pray. It's purity. Humble themselves and pray and seek my face. He didn't say seek his hand. What are you doing now? What can you do for me? Would you, you know, say, and it's okay to say those things, but he wants to show us his face. Proverbs 16, in the light of the king's face, in his face is his glory. So many things. One of the saddest verses in the Bible, 2 Samuel 14, 28. Absalom dwelt two years in Jerusalem never saw the face of his father. I thought, oh, I wept when I read that. I said, God, 
How many of us are living two years, four years, six years in the church and never see our Father's face? When he wants to reveal his face to us, to lift the veil and to commune, that's what the kisses of God are. That's what the intimacy is. You, you taste of that, and you want to, you'll go with him anywhere. You'll follow him anywhere. You'll carry anything he's carrying. When I asked our guys one time, too, all the missionaries were sending, why do you want to go and give birth to that nation? Well, we're commanded to. So I'm going to ask you, why do you want to pray? Because this is the same thing. Well, we're commanded. That's a good answer. Well, we need a reward in heaven. That's a good answer. Well, we want to be obedient. That's a good answer, but that's not what I'm looking for. What should be the motive of our prayer life? Peter, do you love me? You love me, Peter? Yeah, Lord, you know I do. No, do you really love me, Peter? You know I do, Lord. Peter, do you really, really love me? I need you to show me. He did. But there was even a time Jesus said, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? He wants that communion with us because we love him. Do you know that he's not going to bear children with prostitute bride? He's not going to reproduce a harvest with a prostitute bride. He's coming after for a bride that's in love with him without spot or wrinkle, five virgins waiting for his coming. Oil is filled, lamps are filled with oil, the fruit of the, and the, filled with the fruit of the Spirit and the, and the power of the Holy Spirit and occupying, waiting for the bridegroom. And that's who he's coming for. So when I went up into, these war, into the war zone in, in Uganda, and it was off limits, when darkness is so thick you can cut it with a knife, but God, there's no plan B, there's no plan C, and there's no plan D. And as long as we have all of our plan Bs and Cs and Ds, we will revert to them. Plan A is prayer and the Holy Spirit. Plan B is prayer and the Holy Spirit. Plan C is prayer and the Holy Spirit. And plan D is prayer and the Holy Spirit. No other agenda but God. And when we began pouring our heart out, this is the way I felt, and I believe when I come to America, this is what I think. Hannah was barren, and she wanted a son. And she wept, and if you read 1 Samuel 1, it says, with anguish, languish, travail, pleading. She wanted a son so bad. God answered her prayer, but gave her more than she asked for gave her a prophet and her womb was filled. We felt like Hannah. Six hour prayer meetings a day for eight months. Seven days a week. Eight months. There were no churches. It was a war zone. Bloodbath. A thousand people a day dying. 50,000 children abducted. Turned into child soldiers. Diseases. Famine. Starvation. Millions in IDP camps. And Joseph Coney, the dictator, was doing human sacrifices every day and calling himself Jesus Christ. But God is power from Lucifer. Darkness of another kind. But God found a second Chronicle 714. Yes. And he moved in. And in five days after we held, after eight months of prayer, and we went down to the stadium, which is nothing more than a grass field. We had to fast and pray for 40 days just to get that field. We fasted for 40 days just to get the field to pray it, to put it on the radio so we could invite 1,000 people because we didn't have any in our little hut, in our prayer hut. We didn't have enough room. And when the government gave it to us after fasting for 40 days because they said, no, you can't pray there. I said, we're going to pray there. No, you can't. We're going to pray there. We fasted for 40 days. I went back and they said, yeah, you can have it. That's how fast God can bind a strong man and turn the heart of a king and take down evil. And when you've used your rifle and the sword of the spirit and all the bullets you can think of and you're not busting through, then get out the bomb and throw an atomic bomb on it. And that's fasting. Yeah. 
This kind doesn't go out except by prayer and fasting, Matthew 17, 21. After 40 days of fasting, we got the field. Then we fast another five days with 1,000 people, groaning eight hours a day. We prayed the word. And I'm going to be talking much more about that. We prayed the word. We wept the word. We pleaded the word because God honors the word. Not our emotions, not our pity, not our regret. He honors his word. He looks for repentance. But from the word, we fall on that rock and are broken. And when he saw what he was looking for on the fifth day, the government calls me and says, are you guys the ones praying in that field? I said, yeah, there's a thousand of us. Why? He said, it feels like there's a big black curtain that's been pulled back in the heavenlies. This is an unbelieving governor. A big black curtain's been pulled back. And he says, the whole atmosphere in the region, the sky in, over the region is totally changed. We can feel it. Everybody's talking about it in the government offices. I'm sitting at the other end of that phone, and I start bawling. I said, God, your word, it's true. Second, Corinth, Second Chronicles said, when the heavens are brass, if my people. When the plague comes in, COVID, if my people. When the enemy comes in like a force with death and destruction on our children, with trafficking, with abortion, if my people. Yes. Can God lie? No. Numbers 23, 19. He cannot lie. He watches over his word to perform it. Heaven and earth will pass away. God's word will never fail. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank but his promises are conditional. His love is unconditional but his promises are conditional. Deuteronomy 28, if you hearken diligently to my voice, you will be blessed. But if you choose to disobey, then you're going to have trouble following you. If you want to be my disciple, take up your cross, deny yourself, follow me. Why? Because he gave us a free will. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And just like my sister said, it's not these meetings, these three days that are going to change you. What are you going to do next week? It's your free will. Do you want to be with the bridegroom in the labor room and give birth? Do you want to be of those, Revelation says, they followed the lamb whithersoever he goes? Because they love what's in his heart. Now I want to give you another picture. So after the war ended, by the way, that was the end of the war. There wasn't another ambush. And I thought, Lord, I'm done. We're, we're finished praying. I'm going up to South, I'm going up to Sudan. I thought, thank God, he ended the and, and I'm finished. He said, oh, no, you're just starting. Get ready for the babies. I said, babies. In the first few years, a thousand churches planted, thousands every month getting saved, every miracle in the book of Acts. I mean, there was children's homes and orphanages and women empowerment and Bible school started. We didn't have any money. So he said, you, you want to do a Bible school? You want to bring in orphans? Okay, you bring in the girls. They can have my room. I slept in the garage. Bible school, I'll get you some, I'll get you some photocopied curriculum from Kampala. Start your school. Well, what is it? well, here's the hut. It's got a roof. Get those men in there and sit them on the floor and teach them. And if there's any food, they can have potatoes and water just like we're eating, and they can sleep right there too. And then be ready for the class the next day. And that's how we started. You know why? Because prayer makes, when you give birth to that baby, prayer makes you very creative. You're positioned now to take care of the, the vision that's been birthed, the souls. You're positioned. You're ready. You're not going to abandon what you've just given birth to. And so that's the purpose of prayer. Now, another picture in the word. Remember the, the flood, okay? So Noah's in the ark. I'm just fast forward, okay? 40 days, rain and everything. He's in the ark, okay? He's got all the animals in there. It's been raining. They've been locked up in there. It probably smells too. I mean, that's a lot of, you know, all those animals, right? And he's locked up. He's ready to get out. 
and he's trying to see if there's any dry land. Now, God destroyed the earth with a flood because it was wicked. And he said, in the last days, it will be as of the days of Noah. Wickedness. Wickedness. Sodomy and more. Wickedness on every hand. After the flood, God said, send out a raven. So he sends out a raven to see if there's any dry land, right? Then he sends out a dove. Why did the dove return? There was no resting place, right? The dove represents the Holy Spirit. We see that, okay, in the Bible. The dove returned. Can't find a resting place, Noah. It's just, just water out there. So it comes back to Noah, waits a while, sends out the dove again. Go try to find a resting place. The dove returns to Noah. No resting place. I think he, got, he had a twig in his mouth, but not enough to make a nest, not enough for a dwelling. Goes back. Third time, Noah sends a dove, and the dove doesn't return. And I was standing in the back of church one time in Oklahoma, pastors preaching. I covered my pastor every, every minute of every day. I just, I was, that was my assignment, just travailing for that man's life and the word. And God would show me what he's going to preach before, before Sundays. So I already knew. So I was praying forth the word, and sure enough, he'd get up and preach it. Never talked to him about it, but I knew. He said, ahead of time, I'll show you. I'm sitting in the back of the church where I like to, and i interceding for the service. Birth them, God. Birth the souls. Birth the souls. And all of a sudden, I double over in travail, weeping silently, just silently in the spirit of God. Romans 8, 26 says, my spirit will pray through you with groanings. The earth is groaning. Signs of the times, wars, famines, room, the war, earth is groaning, but the Holy Spirit's groaning. And in Romans 8, 26, he's looking for a resting place. How many times have we quenched the Holy Spirit or grieved the Holy Spirit because we were too busy to be a resting place for his groanings? And he went back and said, Father, can't find a habitation yet. Can't find one. Father waits a little bit. Jesus intercedes before the throne. Then he says, Holy Spirit, go again. You've got to find a place. You've got to find a habitation. You've got to find a place where you can settle down and groan. You know why? Because the Lord Jesus has chosen that his government and everything he does in this earth will be ruled, ordained, and accomplished through the agreement of the bride that he paid such a high price for. waiting on that bride to get along. So can God delay his judgment? Well, one man had a prayer meeting in the belly of a whale. I hope we don't have to get there before we have our prayer meetings. <laughs> but he had a prayer meeting. And guess what? God changed his mind. He's about to wipe out Nineveh. And after Jonah's the prayer meeting, he says it's better to line up with God than run away from him. Let me yield. And he adds several hundred years to the city of Nineveh in spite of their wickedness because they repented. God can delay judgment when he finds his bride in line with him. Let me tell you one more example. We were digging a well for our orphans in Uganda in the days when the war was just coming to an end and we needed a well. And I believe tonight God's digging deeper wells. Amen? Amen. Yes. Throwing out a little dirt, throwing out the cares of the world, throwing out distractions, teaching us how to change the drill bit. And I'll tell you a lot more stories in the next few days, but I want to tell you this. So they started drilling. The engineers were there. And they drilled... And after they finished drilling, now I'm on the phone with them because I was in Sudan. And I said, now I, I, I want you to drill a well that will never run dry. 
And I think that's what the Lord asks us. Are you willing to be a well that ain't going to run dry? Not when you have a good time and a bad time, bad mood or good mood, busy or not busy, it ain't going to run dry. Living water is going to come right out of that well. And it starts the source of it, that fountain of life and that prayer. So I said, you dig a well that will never run dry. They hit water, and here comes the water bubbling up. They said, we got water. I said, is it going to last in dry season or is it going to run dry? Well, probably dry up in dry season. I said, that's not good enough. Go deeper. And they said, there is rock down there. We can't go deeper. I said, you mean you can't drill through rock? Well, we can, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. And we have to change the drill bit. It's a different kind of tip, this diamond tip stuff now that can go through rock. I said, you pull that shaft out. I'm giving them orders over the phone. You pull that shaft out, you change that drill bit, and you go for water. I want more water than that because we can't run dry. We got children. Yes, ma'am. So he pulls out the shaft, changes the drill bit. I get a call back in a few minutes. He said, we hit a second river. And the force of water under that rock was so intense with so much pressure, it shot up like a geyser. And there was no stopping it. All the engineers from the round came to see the force of that water. And when I saw that, again, I just started crying because they were taking pictures and sending me. And I said, God, there is a geyser in the belly of your bride, and we got to hit it. We got to hit it. We got to go deeper. We got to dig that well. We got to get that dirt out. We're going to go for water that will never run dry because there's a thirsty world. And that river will become that Ezekiel 47 river. An explosive revival. I could go on and on with stories about that. But I feel tonight that there is a river of living water from out of our belly that must be broken open, dug deeper. And when you hit water at a second level, there will be no effort in prayer. There will be no struggle. It becomes such a joy that you can't wait. When Ebola came to Uganda, plague, a plague, right? Second Chronicles 7.14 says he, your plagues and everything, if my people. The government was panicking. What are we going to do? We don't have enough body bags. 40,000 people are going to be gone in two weeks. Very severe strain. 2007, we hit the floor in prayer. Do you know when it's time to give birth and carry a baby, it's not about you. It's about the baby. But you know what happens when you give birth to that baby? God changes you. And we become more in the image of Jesus. Our flesh might tear a bit. Your flesh tears when you give birth. There might be some tears. Your water breaks. But it's about the baby. Rachel was weeping for her children and would not be comforted. Jeremiah 31, 15. You can either choose to give birth to God's purposes or you can choose to be comfortable. You can't do both. Comfort robs us from the deep things of the Lord. And change, comfort is an enemy of change. Do you know when we get comfortable what happens? We just kind of snuggle down on the couch and it's just a resting place, then we become complacent. And then we become apathetic. Oh, the dishes need to be done a lot. I'll I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, they need to be saved out there and the baby's brought in and the lost. I'll get it next week. And the Lord said if the harvest is ripe right now, it's rotting tomorrow. We're losing it. But we're comfortable. Complacent apathetic, then compromised, and then lukewarm. And when we become lukewarm, 
Revelations 3.18. Prayer will keep you hot. Prayer will keep you on fire. I asked God, what's your temperature for lukewarm? He said, don't worry about it. Just stay hot. I was like, okay. How do you stay hot? Get into the closet with the all-consuming fire. You'll be sweating. Stay in the closet with the all-consuming fire. You want fire in your bones? Get close to the fire. Fire in our mouth. Jeremiah had fire in his mouth, fire in his bones. Commune with the fire, the all-consuming fire, and it captures you, possesses you. Every single thing we do there, all things by prayer and fasting, all things by prayer and supplication, all things with prayer and thanksgiving, all things. Two hours a day we spend in prayer. Two hours at noon, the community comes, fills the house of prayer for prayer meetings. Every devil in the city, every witch doctor, every Satanist comes to our prayer meetings. You know why? They come to destroy it. I said, if we can just kill that generator, we'll cut the source of power. And that devil knows that. Because Coney himself, human sacrifices, highest level of cult, UN said that was the worst atrocity they'd seen since Hitler, said, what week did you guys pray in that stadium? We told him the week. He said, that's the week I lost my power. When we're on our knees, God disarms the devil. He disarms hell when we get on our knees. We don't see that happen, but we see the fruit of that. He binds the strong man. We get to go spoil the goods. Matthew 12, 29. Prayer binds the strong man in the stronghold. Daniel didn't see it happen. He didn't see Gabriel come and fight, and Michael come and fight with the prince of the power of the air over Persia, and then over Greece in Daniel 9 and 10. He just get to see Israel set free because he was willing to pray until. Isn't it wonderful? God said, I heard you from the first day. Thank God you didn't stop after 20 days. Until. How long do we pray? Until. How, do you st- how long do we have to stay in the upper room? Until the Holy Spirit. How long do we beat on our chest? Isaiah 32. Until the Spirit is poured out. God's timing. He was four days late, but he was right on time. Amen. He knows exactly what he's doing in us and in others in using that intercession if we are faithful. Go after it, not just for the answers. We document answers. We document souls. How many were saved this week? How many delivered? We document the miracles. But that's, and that's an exciting and enthusiasm. But if we ever forget the motive for being in intimacy and intercession for interception, then we've lost our first love. Many follow Jesus for the miracle not because they loved him. We pray because of the first love. He said, come back and do the works you did at first as the New Testament church did. They loved him and they spent time in his presence. Do you have to go, Jesus? He said, if I don't go, I can't give you the Holy Spirit. If I give you the Holy Spirit, he can be with you everywhere and he can pray in all of you and he'll empower you to pray because that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit is groaning in us, praying in us. 1 Corinthians 2, the mind of Christ. He knows what the mind of God is. He knows what God wants you to pray for today. I don't want to pray my mind. I want to pray his because I know it's going to get done if I pray his. If I pray mine, I might be wrestling, and he goes, you go ahead. Are you finished now? Now let's get in my boat. And that's what he says. So he's patient with us, but I'd rather get in line with what he's praying. And while I pray with what's on his heart, he takes care of what's on my heart. You build his house, he'll build yours. Amen. And he says that even in Haggai. It's just beautiful. My house shall be called. Not a house of miracles, not a house of preaching, not a house of singing, a house of prayer for all nations. And nations, every one of the lost, every one of the kids, every one of those babies dying, every one of the addicts, every one of this, that. My house of, a house of prayer for them. For them. I watch people get healed of cancer because they began travailing for somebody else who had cancer.
and God came. Give and it shall be given to you. Cast your bread on many waters, Ecclesiastes 11, it'll come back to you. I want us to stir ourselves up on our most holy faith, Jude says, by praying always in the spirit. And then he said, stir up one another to love and good works. And then he said through Paul to Timothy, stir up the gift that's in you. Prayer is a gift. It's a privilege. I was just talking to a Catholic lady today who got saved, and she said, I was supposed to be a nun, but I got so mad because the, the priest told me I couldn't talk to Jesus. I had to talk to him. I said, well, good for you. You threw off the nunnery stuff, and you came and found the great high priest. And she got married to Jesus and got saved. And now she's an intercessor. You know, we, we can go face to face. It's a privilege. It's intimacy. What he gives back to you from the prayer closets, you cannot measure. Somebody said, what a sacrifice. You live over there. You go through guns. You're in danger. You sleep in huts. You eat bugs. You eat termites. You eat... Yeah, I do all that. What a sacrifice. What a sacrifice. said, sacrifice? Are you kidding? I said, I'm in love. If you're madly in love and your husband says, well, I want us to move to Germany, you don't say, okay, bye, you go. I'm, I'll be right here when you get back. <laughs> oh, no, I'm going with you. Yeah. What's different is Jesus. When you're in love with him, you don't question, well, where are we going to go? How long is this going to take? How, we watch in the clock. How much more time do we have to pray? Get back to the intimacy. And it becomes a joy. And I want God to birth that in you. I want God to break open something in you. We're going to worship a little bit. You can come forward. You can pray, whatever. But I want you to lay your hands on your belly and say, God, birth in me an intimacy, an intimacy. Break open the wells of revival, the deeper love, the springs of living water that will never run dry. Break it open. Ask God to bust open that river of living water. Do you know what Jesus said to the, to the woman at the well in John 4? I want to give you water, honey. I'm going to give you water. You'll never be thirsty again. And I feel like the Lord says that in the closet. I just want to give you water. Come on in here with me. And you'll never, never thirst for anything else again. It'll change you as you are able to change others. You take that living water. You'll be part of that Ezekiel 47 river. And everywhere it goes, it brings life. Because it comes from the source. There's a deeper river. And it comes from the depth of intimacy. And then no cost God asks of you will ever be a sacrifice. If he says, now will you take 10 heroin addicts home and love them and mentor them and nurture them until they're free, delivered, healed? Sure, Daddy, these are your kids. Sure. And here we are, be willing, because we've been positioned in prayer for the promise. We've got to be positioned in prayer if we're going to contain the promise. Amen. Hallelujah.